Okay, well, that was Mike Coles of newliferadio.co.uk in Exeter. And I'm Ram Bailey from BibleBase.com, welcoming you to another episode of Broken Bread, where we are looking into the letter of Paul to the churches of Galatia. And I need to give you a little warning that um, I have been fighting with my computer most of the day. Paul fought with wild beasts in Ephesus. I fight with computers. Um... For those of you who use Macs, I've been having multiple kernel panics. For those of you who don't, it just means it keeps on switching itself off for no apparent reason. So if I lose you, uh, Michael, come in and uh, play some piano music for you or something while I try to get it up and running again. So this could be a little bit interrupted. So please bear with me as we look at study number 18 that I'm calling... Back to the Future. There you are with a nice science fiction twist to it. And I've got a science fiction illustration I'm going to use in a moment or two. We're reading in Galatians chapter 3, and we've been looking at some of the things it says. And you remember that Paul, uh, having spoken of his own faith in Christ and his encounter with F Peter, <clears throat> in which um, he, may, he pointed out to Peter that it had to be by grace through faith and could not be through law works. And then he addresses the people that he knows in the churches in Galatia. And he says, he asks them a basic question. He says, when you received the Spirit, was that because you kept the law? Was it because of law works or was it because of faith? And then he says, having begun in the Spirit, are you made complete now by law works? And then he says, um, the one who continues to work miracles amongst you by the Spirit, is that because you're keeping the law or by grace through faith? And the answer to all those things obviously is, well, no, it's by faith, it's by faith, it's by faith. And faith, remember, is always response to grace. So it's everything that God does is always by grace through faith. That's the way he works. I'm going to try and do something with, with a complicated uh, science fiction idea here which has to do with space time anomalies I touched on these when we tried to look at the, the topic of um, Jesus becoming a curse for us something happened in Abraham's time that affected the future now we are familiar with that idea I think but something would happen in the future that would affect Abraham now I don't know how good you are with your Bible chronology but Abraham as a rule of thumb, is about 2,000 years before Christ. But something was going to happen in the future that would have an impact on the past. You say, oh, help, I'm at sea already. Let me see if this little illustration helps. I remember one of the early Star Trek things, the original Star Trek. They had one of these little struggles with what they called space-time anom anomalies when time all get mixed up. There were two characters from different periods of time and they'd come together to thwart uh, the local baddie of that particular ep episode. One, I think, was from the year 2100 and one was from the year 2200. And they discover that the timeline shows that they will meet in the future. So they're, they're working together now at this point in time, but actually they haven't met yet in Earth's timeline they discover that the timeline shows that they will meet in the future. When they've beaten the villain, they say their goodbyes, and they have a great line. This is the illustration. See if it illustrates, or just makes the water even more muddy. One says, I'll see you again in 20 years' time. And the other says, yes, I'll see you again in about two hours. OK, don't try and work it out now. I'll repeat it. One says, I'll see you in 20 years' time, and the other says, yes, I'll see you in about two hours. That's something for you to think about. We were looking at Abraham, weren't we? And we saw that we are Abraham because we're the sons of Abraham, because we share Abraham's faith. It's Abraham-like faith. Abraham was not justified by law works. The law came 430 years later. So we come 
to God on the same basis that Abraham did, by grace through faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Abraham heard God speak to him. Abraham believed God. God reckoned it to righteousness for him. This is Galatians 3, verse 7 to 9. Therefore know that... Now, the New King James Version puts in italics the word only here. And although it isn't in the original, it makes the point well. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. That's why we refer to in the Bible as sons of Abraham, because Abraham is the father of all believers. He is the archetype. He is the fountainhead of this kind of justifying faith that puts all its eggs in one basket and trusts God, God, trusts God absolutely. And then as you go on through chapter 3, Paul becomes occupied with a promise. I think in about 16, the last 16 verses or so, he refers to a promise nine times. And he makes this point. It links in with that passage that we did from about Christ becoming uh, the law, the curse. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed as everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. God promised blessing for the Gentiles, that in him, through Abraham, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He promised that. But apparently that promise only comes true for the Gentiles in Christ. When they're in Christ, that promise becomes true. And the, the blessing of Abraham becomes theirs. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. Now we say, well, what is the promise then that occupies Paul's thought in this passage, Galatians 3, verse 14 to 29? What is the promise? Well, here it is, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, how did he get from justification by faith in the first half of this chapter to the promise of the Spirit. How did we get there? Well, Abraham's event of justification, which you remember, I hope, is in Genesis chapter 15, that was followed by another event. After his justification, after God had reckoned him righteous and declared him to be right with him because of his faith, after that there was another event in the same chapter. After his justification, he received a promise. Now, we need to get this clear in our minds if we can. The promise was not justification by faith. The promise followed justification by faith. And it's not the Abraham covenant. That doesn't come until Genesis chapter 17. The sign of that covenant, you remember, was circumcision. So what is this promise that Paul is referring to? Well, the story goes like this that Abraham at a certain point in his life asked God a question. And his question was, well, God had said that he would um, have children, uh, as a child in particular, and that there would be many who would come from him. And he asks this question. I don't think he's belligerent. He's not arguing with God. I think in his faith, he's reaching out and asking a genuine question. Lord Jehovah, he says, how shall I know? that I will inherit it. We're back to where we were last week, aren't we? How do we know that we know? How shall I know that I will inherit it? And God tells him to do something. He tells him to prepare for a covenant ceremony. Now, in ancient times, the time of Ab that Abraham was living, when two kings or two tribal leaders wanted to make an alliance, maybe a, a peace alliance or a promise that they would defend one another against attack, that kind of thing, um, they would do it like this. They would take animals and they would slaughter the animals and they didn't sacrifice the animals, they just slaughtered them. They slaughtered them and they cut them in half and made an avenue of death 
a bloody pathway. And then each party to the covenant that was going to make would come from either end of that and they would meet in the middle. And as a result of this blood around, they were effectively saying, if I break this covenant, uh, let me share the fate of these animals. That's what they were saying. It's what's known as, um, well, it, it's a kind of a promise. It's a promise of uh, horrible things to happen. If you were a little, a little boy, if you made the promise, I cross my heart and hope to die, that was one of those promises. You probably didn't realize, but it was a very ancient idea. So they would enter this avenue of death, meet in the middle, and make their promises one to another. So Abraham is told that he must do the same thing. He must create this corridor of slaughtered animals. Obviously, Abraham would know that this speaks of a covenant. There's going to be a covenant. Now, up until this point, maybe this will surprise you, but up until this point in Abraham's story, there's been no mention of a covenant. The last time we mentioned a covenant in Genesis is the covenant that God made with Noah after the flood. And then there's this one. This is the next covenant that comes on the scene, a covenant between God and man. So God declares the covenant ceremony. Abraham prepares the scene and waits and waits and waits. And when he started this exercise, it was night time because God says, look up and see the stars. And if you can count that, those that so many children you're going to have. And he waited. And he waited through till the next morning. And he waited through till the time that the vultures begin to find the hot air thermals and soar up into the air. What time is that? 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning. And they came down to try and steal the animals that were still there in this avenue of death. And Abraham drove them away. And then an amazing thing happens. It says, this is Genesis chapter, um, the same chapter, Genesis chapter 15 and verse 21. Um, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, uh, Abraham. Sorry, that's why I got the verses mixed up. This is Abraham. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham. See, he wasn't named Abraham yet. That came when God made a covenant with him in Genesis chapter 17. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Now this word that is translated as a deep sleep is used about seven or eight times in the Old Testament, and it's nearly always linked with some idea of deep spiritual experiences not out of the body, but certainly conscious at a level, but almost so conscious that the natural things around you become almost vague and shadowy. You've passed into a spiritual world. This is the kind of deep sleep that God put Adam into when he created Eve. This is Genesis 2 and verse 21. And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And God took one of his ribs and clothed up the flesh in its place. So during that operation that took place, Adam was in a deep sleep. And then all these years later, Abraham now is in a deep sleep. And in this deep sleep, there's a horror and a great darkness that falls upon him. And he witnesses something. Something happens We'll get to it in a moment. Something happens. But in what Paul is saying in Galatians chapter 3, he says that God made a promise, a promise about the Spirit. Now, you can read Genesis chapter 15 as carefully as you like, and you will find no mention of a promise of the Spirit, not specifically. So what's all this about? Well, in the line of Paul's explaining of this thing he's been showing that justification by faith has to be by grace through faith and it's not law works we don't make any contribution now you might say well adam contributed a rib well yes maybe he did in one sense but actually he made no choices in this 
This wasn't Adam's choice. This wasn't a covenant that God made with Adam. This is God taking over, putting Adam into a deep sleep, and then doing things with Adam that are beyond Adam's comprehension, and quite frankly, beyond mine too, I guess, yours too. So what's the connection between receiving the promise of the Spirit and justification by faith? Well, it's this that Paul introduces in Galatians chapter 3, that the coming of the Spirit is, in a way, a proof that justification is by faith, because you could never earn that beginning in the Spirit. You could never earn that receiving of the Spirit. You could never earn that presence of God in the meetings when you gather together and God is still doing wonderful things amongst you. You could never earn that. So, obviously, if this promise of the Spirit comes after the justification by faith, then it's obvious that justification by faith is not by law works. Now, please listen to this very, very carefully, otherwise you're going to get me into a lot of trouble. I am not saying that the personal receiving of the Spirit is proof of justification. I will repeat. Please have patience with me. I'm not saying that the personal receiving of the Spirit is proof of justification. I am not saying that the initial evidence of justification is the receiving of the Spirit. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that the receiving of the Spirit could never be earned by law works. And so it is proof, not that I or you have been justified, but that justification is by faith. That's what it's a proof of. The receiving of the Spirit is not a proof that we have received the Spirit, so that we have been justified by faith, but that salvation is by grace through faith. So that's why Paul says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 2, this only, I wanted to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? or by the hearing of faith. Having begun in the Spirit, he says, on the ongoing ministry of the Spirit. So there was a promise made. Well, Abraham wasn't conscious. He was in a deep sleep. In fact, this whole chapter begins with Abraham. The word of the Lord comes to Abraham in a vision. These are mysterious things. The revelation of God's will comes to him in a vision. Now, how much of chapter 15 is a vision... I don't know. But God said things to him in a vision. And then when he's in this deep sleep, a promise is given. But to whom was the promise given? Well, if we go on to chapter 3 and verse 16 of Galatians, we find this phrase. It says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Oh, Abraham and his seed. And then Paul adds this comment. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, that's to say in the plural, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ? All right, let me put that answer back into my question. To whom was the promise given to Abraham and Christ? Really? In Genesis chapter 15, well, I'm only reading what it says in my Bible. This promise was given to Abraham and his seed. You say, well, Jesus wasn't there, was he? Ah, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. In the previous, sorry, in chapter 3, verse 19, it says, What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Now, remember, we found who the seed is. The seed is Christ. So let's put that into this verse. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions until Christ should come to whom the promise was made. Really? In in Roman, in Gal Genesis, got it. In Genesis chapter 15, a promise was made to Abraham and to Christ. Now this is mysterious stuff. While Abraham was in this deep trance sleep, somehow he witnessed something. I guess this is how we know about it. 
what he witnessed was Abraham didn't step into that avenue of death, into that bloody path that the two covenant makers would take in order to come together. He was asleep. He was a sleeping partner to this particular covenant. And here's an interesting verse from Hebrews. I'm joining together some mysterious verses here for you and trying to create a scenario that I think puts them all together. We know from Hebrews that Abraham did not receive the promise sense of experiencing the gift of the Holy Spirit. We did that last week, I think, or the week before, or the week before that. It all begins to kind of blur now. We know from Hebrews that Abraham did not receive the promise in the sense of experiencing the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is Hebrews 11. You know, you've got this wonderful list of heroes of faith, and he says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That's 11.13. And then in 11 of those 39, having added another little group of people, um, this is to whom was the promise given, and we've discovered, maybe it's a surprise, but we've discovered that the prize the promise was given to Abraham and Christ. Although, where was Christ in this strange event that took place? And we've said we know that Abraham did not receive the promise of receiving the Spirit in that full sense. That's, uh, that's there very plainly too. So, when was the promise made to the seed? It looks as though, although Abraham didn't pass through that path of blood and sacrifice, a covenant was made. Because in his deep dream sleep vision, Abraham sees two objects come into that corridor of death. I think they came from separate ends. One was a smoking oven and the other was a flaming torch. And it seems that the two came together. No word is spoken that Abraham heard or can record. He continues in his deep sleep. But something is happening here. Something from the past and the future is being reenacted. This is my scenario. This is the father and the Son, sealing their covenant on earth, witnessing to their covenant on earth, of that that will be accomplished through Abraham's seed, who is the Christ, who is to come. I told you this was a space-time anomaly. Paul's letter to Titus, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Now, just listen to this. Paul, a bondservant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with goodness. Now listen to this phrase. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Now then, if God promised eternal life, the God who cannot lie, if he promised eternal life before time began, to whom did he promise it? Not to the angels, not to Adam and his generations. This is in hope of eternal life. This is a mysterious statement and it's, Paul doesn't explain it. But obviously, there was a choice made within the Godhead before the world was created, before ever there was an angel, or before there was a man, before there was a devil, before there was sin, before any of these things, God, knowing what would take place, made a choice. And his choice was that man would be created and that he would be redeemed when he turned his back upon the destiny that God had for him. 
So, where's that going to take us? One of the reasons I say that it couldn't have been made with Abraham is that he was asleep in a deep, trance-like sleep. But the second reason is that it couldn't have been made with Abraham is that covenants require consents. There's a difference between a promise and a covenant. Um, all covenants are promises, but not all promises are covenants. Because I can make a promise to you and I say, OK, I'm going to send you a bunch of flowers. There's my promise. Now, you don't have to respond to that. You don't have to say anything and you'll get them through Interflora or whoever it is. If Interflora don't exist, you'll get the flowers. That was a promise. But if I make a covenant with you, covenants require consent. Covenants are two-way traffic. Abraham was not part of the covenant that was sealed in that avenue of death. But there were two persons, two parties to the covenant. A smoking oven and a flaming torch. Mysterious symbols. Through much darkness, these things must pass until the light shone in all its glorious brightness. What purpose then does the law serve? Asks Paul. It was added because of transgressions until the seed should come, Christ, to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. That is talking about another promise. The covenant was between God and Christ, God and the seed. Abraham, in his vision, was a sleeping witness to a space-time anomaly. So the God who cannot lie promised eternal life. Before time began, a choice was made within the Godhead to create and redeem mankind. Then God does make a promise to Abraham. In that day God made a covenant with Abraham, saying unto thy seed have I given this land from the river Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Now, when it says God made a covenant, does that refer to that strange event when Adam Abraham was asleep? I don't think it does. I think this is subsequent to that covenant. This, incidentally, as I mentioned, is the first promise of a covenant um, in the story of Abraham and God. So how do I interpret this? What is my scenario? Well, the events just recorded were the establishing of a covenant between Abraham and God, but a covenant was enacted on earth here of an eternal choice, a smoking oven and a flaming torch, while Abraham continues to sleep his deep sleep. And there's another mysterious verse in the letter to the Hebrews where the writer is showing that Christ had to become a man and then in order to qualify to be the human race's high priest. Uh, he had to qualify. And he became a man and he suffered as a man. And in the beginning of that, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16, it says this in the old King James Version, Verily he that would be God, he took on him not the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Now in all the modern translations, they'll tell you that this idea of taking hold, it really is just a metaphor for help. And certainly in kind of Greek of the day, it was used like that. I don't know that it's used in the Bible like that. It may be. I don't know. But I want to take this at its literal face value. At some point on earth in time, God did not take a grip of angels in order to fulfill his purposes of redemption. But he took on him, he took took a grip of the seed of Abraham. Oh, this is mystery. This is mystery. Somehow at that point of time, the eternal choice was enacted and God took hold 
of Abraham's seed that would not be born for another 2,000 years and watched over it. Watched over it through 2,000 years of ups and downs of Israel's history, blessings and disasters. And when the fullness of time was come, he sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who are under the law, as Paul goes on to say later in Galatians. God, in a mysterious way, laid hold of the seed of Abraham that would not come forth for 2,000 years and never let go of it. And you can trace the seed through the Bible. I did this once with some a small group of Christians in Haringey where we, um, we trace the seed and we use as a timeline the first chapter of Matthew working our way through it to give people an idea of the Old Testament who couldn't quite get a grip on the Old Testament. Wonderful, wonderful. You can trace the seed all the way down, some amazing twists and turns, but God pursues. He keeps his hand on the seed. He keeps his hand on the seed until the deed could be done which would make the promise effective, would bring in the new covenant and make it possible for men and women to receive the promise that had been made to Abraham that in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed, but a promise made not only to Abraham but to Christ. In Psalm 2, you have a conversation within the Godhead. And the Son gives this testimony. He says that the Lord has said to him, Ask of me, and I will give you the Gentiles for your inheritance. The promise was made in eternity. The promise was reenacted in my view, in that avenue of death in Genesis chapter 15, and the promise took on flesh and blood in John chapter 1. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has revealed Him. And he revealed the purpose of God and took it all the way to the cross and finished the task that he had been given. And the blood of our covenant victim was shed and it was sealed again in blood so that whoever we are, the promise that was made of the Spirit can come to all others, whether we have in our genes Jews or Gentiles, it makes no difference. The way through is justification by faith. And God promises to give the Spirit to those who obey Him. Well, I'm sorry about the dislocations and interruptions tonight. I hope you'll be able to put this thing together and give it some thought. Thank you again for coming and spending this time here on Thursday nights. That's when we do it anyway. I don't know when it is you listen to it. Um, let us know how you get on. If you have questions about this particular study, why not come to Friends of Bible Base on Facebook and ask your questions, and we'll see. I delight in doing what they call stress testing. So this is my scenario as I put these things together. This is how I think it worked out. This is the only, this is my best fit scenario of all these different pieces of data that the Scripture gives us. Uh, if you have a better one, come and tell me. If you don't like mine, come and tell me. We'll talk about them. I'm going to go now. So God willing, we'll see you same time, same place next week. The Lord bless you.